happy opening day to you. First of all, JJ coming from Baseball America. Great follow on Twitter, too. How you doing, JJ? Great to talk. I'm good. And by the way, you're doing this perfectly. You've got the least fashionable person in baseball in me. And then you follow it up with June, who is on his least fashionable day, 10 times more fashionable. <laughs> so happy opening day, everyone. Thank you. We like to keep the balance going there. So I want to make sure there's a couple things, but I want to make sure we get to this with you. Breaking news last night, which I thought was kind of funny, too, that it breaks last night before opening day. No one's going to look at it, even though I thought there was some positivity to it. The minor leagues have a union now, which is run by the Major League Players Association. They made a deal. Minor leaguers are getting paid more. That's how I look at it. If I'm you know, just looking at it from a right. say, casual fan perspective, G give us the details. Do you like it? What were your thoughts? You're deep into this mix of how things have gone down in the minor leagues for a long time. Well, what AJ said a couple of minutes ago really is true is, is if you looked at it, I started covering the minors in the 90s and I knew coaches who were players in the 60s or 70s. And if you were a minor league player in the 60s or 70s and you were talking to a player even in, say, 2012, situation hadn't changed that much. The facilities were nicer. You no longer had a rusty nail to hang your, uh, you know, your jersey, you know, your, your clothes on, you know, in the clubhouse. Things like that had improved a little bit. But per diem had largely not changed. Housing was still kind of your responsibility. Salaries really hadn't changed. And so a player who signed in 2000 and retired in 2017, a longtime minor leaguer, would not have seen the situation really change much at all. Now you look at it now, over the last five years, we've gone from housing being the responsibility of players in season to now housing is the responsibility of teams. We've gone from... Uh, food being the responsibility of players to now major league teams are required to provide the food clubhouse dues, which were taking a large part of that, you know, that, that, that paycheck are now banned in the minor leagues there, that, that, that is provided by the teams. Salaries have gone up. A complex league player in 2019 could make less than $3,000 for the whole year because you weren't getting paid for spring training. You weren't getting paid for extended spring and you were making less like $300 a week during the short season. Now they're making almost 20K. Now the, at the AAA level, you're making you know, far beyond what you were making just a couple of years ago. The conditions across the minors have changed pretty dramatically in a very short period of time. And I was talking to Garrett Brocious, who former minor league player, now attorney, who's been a part of this. And he just made the points like these players have gotten more done in the last three or four years than we did over multiple generations before that. But nobody ever cared. Nobody ever talked about this stuff, right? That was the big thing for me. The players knew. I mean, my, my family knew because I didn't have any money when I was in the minor league. So why has nobody talked about this? Why was this – what did it take for it to get to this point? How much complaining and how much litigation did it take for the minor leaguers to finally have their say? And then I think the union to kind of get behind them and back them in a fight against Major League Baseball. I think two things. One, I do think social media, the rise of social media in the last 10 years has been really important for this because I tell you right now, if you were a minor league or a major league team, you did not want to show up. I, I, one of the things that stuck out to me, the advocate for minor, for minor leaguers posted a photo of a sandwich from an A's minor league team. You know, like this is what we're getting as a meal tonight. And basically it looked like it was a straight out of the fry festival. And Immediately, you know, the A's put out a release that say, we apologize that that caterer has been, uh, you know, canned. We're going to improve this, all that. You all of a sudden had this fear of being shown up. You had the Oakland A's speaking of during the pandemic, 29 teams said, we're going to pay the players. The A's said, we're not going to pay the players their per diem, you know, at, during this canceled uh, minor league season. And then public pressure forced them to. But I think the other thing that did happen is, in 2020, obviously, we had Major League Baseball reduce the minor leagues from 160 to 120 teams, and that was done unilaterally. Minor league players had nothing to do with that. And I think that may have been, in some ways, that combined with that public pressure to get paid per diem during the canceled season showed minor league players that they did have a voice, that they did have some power here, and that also helped build trust with these groups that were trying to, to advocate for them and you turn around, I, I thought for years, I was a skeptic. I never thought the minor league players would organize a union because there was too much fear of retaliation. 
over the last couple of years, a lot of that fear has been eliminated. And here you are where we're now in a brand new era. If in 2031, Major League Baseball wanted to reduce the minor leagues, they can't do it without the agreement of minor league players, which is a di very different situation than what it was just a couple of years ago in 2020. AJ said, you know, nobody was, nobody was talking about this. I spent 13 years of my 19 seasons in the minor leagues. And JJ did not write one article about me in Baseball America. But that's okay. <laughs> I'm fine with it now. <laughs> I made my career. No. I, this stuff, unfortunately, we only have this 10 minutes. But this stuff is so important. Jared Hughes and I went to the Players Association union meetings in 20, 2012. And we bang the drum about it. And people from the union are partially to blame for this because it's a lot of guys that had no time in the minor leagues. And they said, well, there's no precedence for it. We can't do this. So I want to give a lot of credit to people that stood up for him, especially Garrett, who was part of it. And then he was a smart lawyer, but also for writers like you that really, you know, help push this and help push something that to me is one of the reasons that the game has kind of stayed stagnant because the minor leagues is our equivalent to NCAA football, and yet they don't put as much into it. And so how do you see this changing, how it's going to show MLB, hey, these are development pipelines. These players are good. This is like – these are awesome places to watch games. I think one thing that we're going to see is, is there will be players over the next 10 years who reach the major leagues who wouldn't have under the old system, not because they weren't good enough before, but because they had to give it up because they couldn't afford to play. I mean, which may sound crazy to people to say, oh, what do you mean you couldn't afford to play? Like what you said there, Eric, there was a very, it's very different. If you're a first round pick and you had a very low minor league salary, it's not that big a deal if you had three, four, five million dollar signing bonus to live off of. But if you are a senior signed who got a thousand dollars, if you're a player who signed for five thousand dollars out of the Dominican Republic and you're sending part of your paycheck home to help your family every week, every month, there were players who they got to the point. I remember Garrett Garrett Brochus was actually writing for us at Baseball America as a player about some of these issues. And I remember talking to him and him basically saying, it's time for me to hang it up. I've got a family. I can't keep doing this. The next generation of Garrett's like that. He was a double A. He was a guy who, right situation, he might have played in the majors. The next generation of those players, some of those will get the opportunity because while it doesn't sound like a ton of money, the difference between I'm making $30,000, I get room and board covered, and I get to be paid to train in the offseason – that is going to be the difference between some players saying, I can keep at my dream, and the guys who said, as much as I may have this dream, I've got a family, I've got to give it up. JJ, Baseball America, when I was in the minor leagues and was the paper that every two weeks came in in the big mm -hmm. bundle, and when it came in, everyone, especially in the minor leagues, like, oh, did I make, did I make it? Because your family back home, there was really not a lot of internet coverage or anything. Baseball America was the place you went to the minor leagues. And every GM would swear, I never read that crap. It's crap. They, we don't rank it. And then you get on an airplane to get to the big leagues, and every GM was sitting there in the first seat like this, reading Baseball America. So has it changed? Because you guys are more online-based now than right. just the actual, like the old newspaper style. And by the way, speaking of crowds, I only made it in there one time, crowds, so I don't feel your, I don't feel so <laughs> sorry for you. <laughs> I the thing I would say is it has changed, but at the same time, we still have to do, we still want to do the same things. We still want to be the Bible of baseball that is read all through the minors and major leagues. And and the the it's both harder and easier to do that now because the reality of it is that there's so much more information on the minor leagues. When when you guys were in the minor leagues, just getting like scouting info from a scout who'd seen someone was difficult. Now, you know. Uh, MILB TV, I can watch. I can watch more players in a day than I could cover in a year 20 years ago when I started Baseball America. But on top of that, there's so much more information now. But the key thing for us is, is that means that we also can be faster about it. Back when you guys were in the minors, 
we had one top 100 prospects list a year. Now we update it every month during the season because now when a guy like a Jackson Churio shows up last year, we can go from he's a top 10 prospect in the Brewers system to he's a top 50 prospect in baseball. Now he's a top 10 prospect in baseball in a couple of months where you, know, you go back 20 years ago, we would, we, would have, we would have been hearing about that player at a much slower rate because there just was so much less information out there than there is now. The information, there's a lot more out there, so we have to be faster in how we process it, how we gather it, and how we disseminate it so that we can still be vital to everybody. Hey, JJ, how you doing? Adam Jones here. Hey, yeah. um, Two-part question. Is Dick Beveridge still involved with uh, the minor league union? And who's some prospects out there that aren't in the top 100 that are that you can foresee? Obviously, when guys come off this list with Gunnar Henderson yeah. and and it took tons of guys. Who's the next wave of guys that we have not heard of yet? I have not talked to Dick in a couple of years, um, but obviously Dick was someone who was vital for years in kind of helping organize minor league players at a time like when you're saying that, you know, I, I remember having breakfast at the uh, winter meetings with Dick for years. I have not talked to him a few years, so I don't have a, an update on Dick. But uh, on your second question, on the prospects who uh, are the next wave, I would say that the story of spring training right now, a non-top 100 prospect, but one who will be getting there, I think, pretty quickly, is 16-year-old Padres catcher Ethan Salas. And I, I emphasize the 16-year-old part of that because normally he just signed in January. Normally a 16-year-old uh, you know, player who's coming out of Latin America is headed to the, the Dominican Summer League to make his debut this year. Well, Salas is in is in minor league camp in uh, Phoenix and has been playing double A games. He had a double against a uh, double A pitcher a couple of you know this past week. Josh Norris for us is out there. He's like triple against George Kirby, big leaguer George Kirby. He's a guy who the last guy I can remember doing this is is Pudge Rodriguez was a seventeen year old in the South Atlantic League and it was like wow how does a seventeen year old catcher hold his own in full season mode. I'll be shocked if Ethan Salas doesn't play in the full season minors this year, maybe before he turns 17, which is just crazy to imagine. But also, you know, check out again, uh, Twitter feed I posted, I've retweeted it on this. Check out Ethan Salas's hands. They are some of the quietest hands you will ever see from a catcher. His, how advanced he is for a still teenager is pretty remarkable. He's a guy who we are very interested in getting a lot of looks at this year. JJ, we wish you could have more time with you, and we will. We promise we're going to have you on throughout the season. Hopefully we can line something up next week and get a little post-Jordan Walker, Anthony Volpe debut talk. Thank you so much. Happy opening day to you, and we're going to bring on your, your stylish friend, June Lee, right now. <laughs> but happy opening day, and again, you will now be uh, – the style component of this show will go up by a thousand percent. 